Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to AgriFood Conversations, brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, and the Yield Lab Institute, and also Family Farms Group. My name is Tom Bunn, an associate on the iSelect team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to today's call. On today's AgriFood Conversations call, we are joined by Mario Chapa, CEO at Hive Genie. Hive Genie is bringing the power of technology to help address the worldwide challenges of feed, death, and colony collapse. Its monitoring system includes real-time census data, vital signs collection, GPS location data, and 24-7 access to historical information and alerts. Hive Genie is currently the only ag data service device on the market that's capable of monitoring beehives activities in real time. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Hive Genie's market. You are potential customers for their products and services. You've built and sold a company similar to Hive Genie, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands Hive Genie's market and the challenges it may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who's on the line today. Uh, please take a few seconds to answer. Also, a few process comments. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information about Hive Genie's products and services to help them find customers, mentors, or other strategic relationships that can help them with their business. You're all also on mute. However, you can use the chat window to ask a question. After the formal part of the presentation, we will answer as many questions as time elapses. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Mario Chapa, CEO of Hygiene. Take it away, Mario. Thanks, Tom. All right. So, um... The high genie, let me just uh, skip to the start of my presentation here. Uh, we are a precision agriculture data services, and we are one of the only ones that's completely devoted to beekeeping. Some background, 90% of the nation's crops uh, like apples and 100% uh, of almonds are pollinated by bees. A third of the calories you eat is uh, directly related to bees pollinating some sort of food. Even, even meat uh, requires the meat eating animals. Uh, the, the meat producing animals require uh, some crops that are actually pollinated by bees. For example, cows, they need alfalfa, and alfalfa is pollinated by bees. Uh, 75 to 95 percent of all flowering plants on earth need help with uh, pollinators. Uh, that's over 180,000 different plant species, and more than 12,000 crops need pollination every year. Uh, pollination services, mostly done by honeybees, contribute uh, 275 billion to the global economy and more than 40 billion to the U.S. economy. Uh, almost uh, 97 to 100 percent of the world almond production is dependable on pollination services. Almonds is the number one U.S. specialty crop and generates more than 21 billion dollars in revenue and directly creates more than in a, uh, it creates more than 11 billion in added value on other related services. In 2019, almond growers paid approximately $600 million on pollination services. And this is important because uh, the US is the number one almond producer in the world with around 80% of the production of almonds. So what's the current situation on bees? Uh, pretty much every year, and it's been steady for uh, about 10 years now, 44% of the bee colonies are dying every year in the United States. This is a huge crisis. Just imagine you losing 44% uh, of your equipment or your inventory every year. Or if you were a farmer, uh, just imagine losing 44% of your cows every year. 
And that's where the problem is. This is a very traditional industry where there has not been any significant innovation in over 50 years. We're talking about wooden boxes nailed or glued together and, uh, and beekeepers going and working in the hives the same way it's been done for about 50 years. The last invention 50 years ago was a current high box, which is just a box. So there's, uh, there's a lot of advantages to that box, but it's essentially a box. Another issue that we have is that as farmers get more technified, more specialized and more successful, they start to buy adjacent land and the, uh, their crops start to grow in area. So nowadays we have huge, huge areas that are almost monoculture crops. Uh, in California, for example, you can pretty much drive from uh, LA to San Francisco and 80 or 90% of the crops you'll see there is going to be almonds. And this is a problem for pollinators, uh, specifically for bees. There isn't enough food for them to survive throughout the year uh, because almonds only bloom for a couple of months a year. And then you would have the need for uh, a lot of different flowers that simply are not there. So the way beekeepers have been coping with this is um, they move the hives around. This phenomenon is pretty much um, the largest in the world. And in the US, we call this migratory beekeeping. Every year, over 3 million beehives drive from Maine, from Florida, from Texas, from Montana, from Idaho, uh, Carolinas, all the way to California just for the almond pollination. And they do this because almond farmers pay a premium for pollination services since they completely depend on uh, beehive, beehives for pollination. So a beekeeper can make about $180 in a couple of months per hive. And the usual beekeeper has several, several thousand beehives. Uh, so they, they make a good chunk of money. About 30% of the revenue is generated in California from January to February every year. So this is a big lure for beekeepers. Uh, this creates a big problem as well, because if uh, a few hives are sick, the rest of the colonies, of the three million colonies, are going to get sick as well, because they're in close proximity. There's one beehive per every, per every acre, sometimes up to two beehives per acre. So this means there's a bunch of bees flying and sharing sometimes the same flowers. And there's a lot of uh, possibilities for infections to travel from one beehive to the next. Pretty much 90% of all the commercial bees that are available in the US make it to California for the pollination. The rare exceptions are those that dedicate themselves to produce bees or queens. Uh, and in some instances, honey, that they don't send anything to California. But the rest of the beekeepers are going to be in California from January and February every single year. Uh, so monoculture crop, the close proximity of them, the use of uh, pesticides and the poor nutrition, as well as the typical parasites and, and pathogens, are plaguing the bees in a way that they're making us lose 44% of the beehives every year. And that's why we created the hive genie. So what I learned the hard way is that you can pretty much prevent the vast majority of the things that kill a beehive if 
you know in time, if you're alerted in time. And herein lies the problem. Uh, typically, a beehive inspection, which is uh, very hard work because you have to suit up, uh, light on your smoker, open the beehive, uh, wrestle with 60,000 very mad bees, interrupt their their pollination and bee and honey gathering uh, processes, and then you have to look up every single frame and look for anything that's that's a, could be a potential problem. So this takes anywhere from six minutes to 30 minutes per hive. If you are a commercial beekeeper that has anywhere from 6,000 to 80,000 beehives, this is a big problem. So the, the, the most frequently that you can open your hive and inspect it, it's 14 days, every 14 days. But a death event or a death causing event uh, takes effect in about five days. So there's a lot of five days uh, events that can fit in a 14 day window, right? You can inspect your hive in day one, day two, the problem arrives and by day six, your beehive is dead. Then you arrive back at day 14 and there's nothing there. So, and this I learned again in my own hives. When I, I uh, came back, I realized that uh, rainwater had blocked the entrance and all my hives were dead. And, and they died of uh, starvation or suffocation. And this was completely preventable had I known right away, I would have gone and unblocked that entrance. Uh, and that's when I realized you have, there have to be another way. There has to be some sort of beehive monitor. So I looked in Google and I looked in Amazon and, and I looked in eBay and there was nothing in the market that could tell me how the bees were doing. And, and one of the things that you do as a beekeeper, if you don't want to open the hive, you watch the hive entrance and you see bees coming in and out. And that's why we started uh, with the hive uni. So the hive uni is a technology that can help you count bees. But before I get into the woods with, with the technology, let me talk to you a little bit about the market value of precision agriculture in the United States. Uh, it is defined as observing, measuring, and responding to variability in crops and livestock. And in uh, 2018, the market was uh, $2.2 billion uh, for instruments like yield monitoring, uh, like uh, tracking and positioning devices for things such as cattle, uh, and data analytics. So there's, there's very, very few companies trying to do what we're doing. Uh, and we're actually the only company that can actually count bees coming in and out. The US market is uh, segmented in um, researches, which is about 5% of the beehives in the United States. Hobbyists or backyard beekeepers, uh, there's approximately 2.5 million hives owned by enthusiasts. Uh, and this is about 45% of the market. And then the commercial beekeepers who are uh, only about a thousand commercial beekeepers out there. To be a commercial beekeeper, you have to own more than 1,000 beehives. And uh, this, they account for another 3 million beehives. Pretty much every, every bee that visits California is a commercial beehive. Um, there's an in-between hobbyists and commercials, those who are transitioning, who are called sideliners, and they may have 
uh, anywhere from 30 to 300 or technically less than a thousand beehives. Those will be considered side, side businesses or, or, or side liners as we call them. Worldwide, there is about 82 million commercial beehives that we know of. There, there might be more uh, because really only commercial beekeepers are required to uh, register their beehives. So there might be a lot of uh, pop and mom uh, shops out there that we don't even have a clue. Could be uh, two or three times this number. But anyway, North America has uh, 5.9 million hives. South America, another 5.8. Africa is about 20% of the world market is 6.6 .6 million, 16.6. Europe is 20.9 million, it's one of the most mature markets. Uh, bees are originally from Europe. Uh, Asia has another strain of bees and they have uh, 26.8 million hives, that's another 32% of the market. And the Middle East, it's about 6% of the market with 6 million hives, which is pretty significant for, for the small area that, that is there. So where, where do we fit against other competitors? All of these competitors that, that you see here, they're basically thermometers and microphones, right? Uh, most of them are uh, Bluetooth enabled. Uh, nobody can count these except us. And we think that if you wanna know how your beehive uh, population is, the right approach is to count them as opposed to listening. Listening can tell you certain things, but will not tell you how the population is behaving. Uh, the interesting part is that pretty much all of us uh, are less than seven years old. Currently, only about 10,000 hives are monitored. And so the market, again, is about 82 million hives. So, we think that about 30% will adopt some sort of monitoring within the next 10 years. And here's where the big opportunity is. Um, against uh, other competitors, we try to position ourselves as, as uh, cost effective. If, if you plot us in a diagram where you have the amount of data and the cost, uh, we we really are in the, the high side of the data and in a very moderate cost. We're not the cheapest, we're not the, the most expensive one, uh, but we really are the ones that generate the most amount of data. And data, for, for data's sake, is not good. What's good is what you can do and predict with that amount of data. And we think we can predict uh, events that may kill your bees. We think that we can predict events that may help the beekeeper uh, position their bees in the safest uh, crops, in the safest farms. Uh, and we can predict things as, as uh, weather patterns that might affect the bees, as well as a, a sick sickness event or, or an epidemic that might prompt the beekeeper to move the bees before it gets hit by the wave of the incoming pests. Uh, other things that we can do besides counting, we, we also take into consideration uh, luminosity. We have uh, temperature sensors inside and outside the hive, relative humidity as well. We can also measure weight. We can uh, uh, have a GPS that allows us to track the beehive uh, and we're able to upgrade all our software over the air as well as give the beekeeper uh, a cloud access uh, via any, any smartphone or any computer that has a connection to the internet. Our unit's completely solar powered and uh, 
let's uh, let's go to the uh, future revenue opportunities that we're looking at right now. So farmers are the main uh, business opportunity right now. Farmers uh, help us uh, pay the bills. They help us get uh, our our units on the ground. But there's also the agribusinesses, right? Uh, beekeepers and and other companies that make uh, or give the farmers services like beehive inspection services. If you're paying a couple of million dollars for beehives uh, to pollinate your crops, you wanna make sure those beehives are strong hives, right? Not diluted small hives, uh, which you have to pay full price for. So there's an inspection service on behalf of the farmer that's paying for the for the rental for those beehives, and that inspection service could be done with a hive genie instead of opening a couple of hives and and make sure those are okay. Uh, we can inspect a much broader, if not all of them, uh, if the beekeeper wishes wishes so, we can inspect all the hives that are coming in and we can actually inspect them before they come in and we can actually let the farmer know which uh, colonies are, are better suited for their own activity, which are the strongest ones, which are, are the hungriest ones. Uh, so those are the things that we can provide. Research institutions have been actively purchasing our units as well because uh, right now the way most researchers count bees is they hire a, a bunch of kids with, with uh, thumb clickers and they try to count how many bees come in and out every second of the beehive. Sometimes you can have up to 10 landings and takeoffs per second. So there's no clicker that's gonna do you well if you're just trying to count bees. Uh, the other method of counting is you open the beehive, take pictures of frames, and then try to estimate how many bees are in the frame. So there's not uh, any accuracy in those methods. Our method is, is a beam of light. When the bee crosses the beam of light, we count it. Uh, we actually have a couple of those beams, so we know if the bee is entering or leaving the hive, and, and we can tell very accurately up to 95%, 98% of accuracy uh, what the beehives, what the bees are doing. Government uh, organizations such as the US Department of Agriculture, they have uh, our units as well. And then crop insurance companies are also very interested in seeing uh, what the bees are doing because if if the bees are not working properly, there's not gonna be enough crop. If the bees are not healthy, uh, pollination prices are gonna go up. So those would be data consumers as well. The crop insurance market in the US is uh, right, right now uh, about a $10.1 billion market. They, they paid uh, last year uh, $5.1 billion in losses and, and the government subsidy is capped at 1.4 billion. So what the US government is gonna do is they're gonna start reducing the subsidized in crop insurance program and, and they're gonna try to save around 21 billion from 2020 to 2028 by reducing that government subsidy. Uh, and what they're gonna do is they're gonna start helping pay for the insurance rather than paying uh, for the losses. So this will generate uh, some sort of uh, movement in the industry and the industry is gonna need data to more accurately predict uh, what the crop insurance market is gonna behave like. So this is gonna be an interesting, uh, interesting game for us. A few milestones. Um, in the 2017, we launched our, our Revision Zero and we sold 30 units of it. 
2018, we uh, launched Revision 1, and Bayer bought nine units, and we deployed them in, in different crops to demonstrate that uh, bees have a different pattern uh, for every crop. So we learned that we, by counting bees over time, when they go out, in and out, we can actually tell what kind of crop they are pollinating. Uh, bees seem to behave differently for every crop, and we don't know exactly why, but we think that uh, it has a lot to do with how the nectar is available on the flower. Some, some flowers are uh, early, um, I don't know how to call it, but they, they, they raise their nectar early, and some flowers like to raise their nectar late in the afternoon. So based on that, and, and some other crops have uh, nectar available all day long. So bees know this and, and they follow the nectar uh, availability for each crop. So basically we can tell the farmer when the pollination is over. Uh, it's, it's very, very easy to see how the season goes, the pollination season, because you see the bee activity going up and then the bee activity coming down. And then you can actually see when the bees found uh, the, the crop adjacent to, to your, your crop and because they're pollinating something else and they're behaving completely differently. So we can optimize the pollination cost services uh, to the farmer because we can tell them, okay, you know, you're done. You can remove your bees now. Stop paying for them. And this also benefits the beekeeper because, as a beekeeper, you don't want to have your bees in a in a crop that has no nectar, that has no more bloom. So this will optimize the industry uh, in the in the long run. Uh, in uh, late 2018, we got the, our patent approved. Again, we are the only one that, that's uh, counting bees, and we have a patent that, that lets us be the only one to count bees. And in uh, 2019, we did a, a larger field trial with a revision two uh, units. So that's revision two, it it's, would be our third prototype because we started counting at zero for whatever reason we engineers like to start counting at zero. And then uh, we learned a lot in this uh, 17 units that we deployed uh, around California. And, and for the first time, we actually measured pollination activity and almond bloom and the effects of weather and pesticides. And this is pretty interesting, actually, because uh, as expected, the organic farms uh, showed a gain in bee population and the pesticide intense farms showed a decline in bee population. So this alone is gonna help beekeepers better manage uh, the way they approach their customers and, and their requirements to the customers because now we have scientific data that can tell them, you know, this pesticide that you sprayed this day killed this many bees. And, and shortly we will find the combination of, of pesticides or the single one pesticide that's killing bees. So that's that in itself, it's, it's pretty interesting. And we also were able to see the differences between uh, the way the bees were handled during winter and, and the way they started up the season. Uh, we were able to see the impact of rain and the impact of cold weather and wind against pollination activity. And all in all, we were able to uh, tell the farmer if the pollination job was done or not, which is the main concern for the farmer. Every flower that does not get pollinated will not bear an almond. So it's critical that every single flower gets pollinated. We also did some trials, or we're actually currently doing some trials in blueberries, cranberries, and other crops as well. So what is our growth uh, strategy? Uh, 
right now we are in the process of um, this year we'll, we should have deployed around 250 units once we're certain that all the technical uh, requirements are, are taken care of uh, communication barriers are solved uh, that are software that are cloud-based app that everything's working uh, as it should we're going to open the valve and and uh, by 2020 we're going to start deploying units in the thousands so we, this is our expected growth so far we've sold every unit that we've made but we only made the small batches so this is a, a good test year for revision three that that we're currently uh, testing right now and once we're confident revision three has met all the objectives and all the quality uh, levels that we require for ourselves, we'll be starting an aggressive uh, commercial campaign. Uh, so right now, most of the industry influencers are, are users and beta testers for a unit, and, and we've taken their feedback, you know, which things to add, such as uh, an electronic nose to smell for foul brood, which is a disease that causes uh, a very distinct odor in, in our bees and is very, very lethal. And, and we also were requested to add a GPS, so we added that. And, and it's not only the GPS that you have to add, but it's also the maps in your software. So right now we move our, our uh, platform and we created, we partnered with Amazon Web Services and Amazon to help us develop a very powerful software to store the data, to collect the data, to set alerts to the beekeeper and to analyze that data. And we'll be uh, in a good position uh, in the very near future to start letting uh, artificial intelligence do those analysis for us. So we think that by 2022, we should have more than 27,000 units out there. Our current partners are the American Honey Producers Association, which is the uh, association where all the big commercial beekeepers belong to. Bayer and Amazon Web Services, uh, the wonderful company, which is the number one uh, almond producer, uh, and Onica, which is uh, one of the go-to software companies for Amazon Web Services, and 80 Honey Farms, which is the largest beekeeper in the U.S. with 80,000 beehives, is also a great collaborator in what we call a convert because he already believes in our technology, and we have a very active dialogue with them uh, uh, for the demands that uh, our unit should be capable of. Uh, meeting such as should be able to withstand the heavy duty work that, that these guys do. Uh, these units are loaded and unloaded with um, forklifts and they're moved around every other month. So, and, and the, the weather might be hot, might be rainy, or might be snowing. So, this is a very difficult environment. Uh, and the unit should be transmitting 24 seven. So what we're trying to do here is uh, a cell phone that needs no recharging, that is capable of, of uh, transmitting 24 seven outdoors in any weather condition. This is the level of uh, technological challenge. And it also has to be able to uh, transmit anywhere in the US. There's no uh, full coverage as, <laughs> as the uh, cell phone companies want you to believe. There, there's no such thing. Pretty, um, pretty much all of these farms are always in poor reception areas. So we have to deal with that as well. And, and we think that we're Vision 3, we're, we're there or almost there. Our team is, has grown substantially this year. We have a, a full um, representation pretty much of, of every big community in the planet. 
We have uh, uh, myself, I'm originally from Mexico. Uh, my mother is American, my father is Mexican. Uh, Joe Levi, he is uh, uh, Mexican and Spanish descendant. Then uh, Pradeep, our, our chief technology officer, he's in India as well with other two uh, Indian electronic engineers that's helping us with the development. Joe Jernigan, he is uh, All-American CEO. Manuel Magallanes, he is uh, originally from Venezuela. Uh, he's a petroleum engineer, studied in Romania, and he's helping us with the strategy. Uh, Chester Lopez, he is from, uh, I think it's Bolivia. Rafik, he is the legal counsel for the uh, Washington DC police. Uh, he's American. Galin Kozarov, he is a uh, Romanian. He is our marketing guy. And then uh, our board of advisors, uh, Paola Sapienza, originally from Italy. She is uh, right now in uh, Kellogg University. Uh, Bob Harding, he is uh, also from the United States, uh, as well as uh, Darren Cook. They're both uh, in the uh, in the high tech industry. Uh, Bob Harding right now works in uh, Amazon, and Darren Cook is the CEO of an internet-based company. So we're a pretty pretty good um, diverse team. There's a couple of beekeepers in the team as well. I am one of those beekeepers. I've been a beekeeper for uh, seven years now. And uh, I'm very happy with the way the team has grown and everybody is working uh, not only for free, but I don't, I've never seen this happen before in a startup. Pretty much everybody that you see here uh, that says founder, they've all donated not only work, but they've all invested money. And this to me speaks of the well thought of plan that we have, the technology that we have, and the confidence that the team has placed in the technology and in the team as well. So I'm very pleased with that. And with that, I would like to open it up for questions. Thank you very, very much, Mario. Very interesting, and uh, congratulations on the progress to date. Um, so as a reminder, to, to ask a question, you can uh, do a, a couple options. You can raise your hand and I can unmute you, or you can go to the question pane and uh, type in your question and I will read it to Mario. Um, Mario, to, to get us started here, what's what's uh, the biggest thing keeping you up at night? And what's, what's the rest of 2019 look like for you what are your what are your main focuses so still still connectivity is still a big problem uh, there's a reason why you don't see uh internet of things based companies for the outdoors because it's very difficult to connect uh let's say in the mountains of montana or colorado there's not always good reception so we're trying to work with that and solve that in different uh, with different technologies, and, and and that's pretty much the things that we have um, still to better solve. So we're looking for more sensitive uh, transmission equipment, and and really we can't wait for the uh, the aerospace based uh, or satellite based internet because. Ultimately, that would be the, the solution, but it's not available right now. So we, we have to deal with cell phone signals or radio signals for now. Um, what we've done is our communications module, it's, it's something that, that we can exchange fairly easily in our, in our main board. So it's, it's not soldered, it's connected. So we can disconnect uh, the SIM card and connect the radio transmitter in there. And in the future, we will be able to connect an internet, uh, satellite-based internet as well. So we're already prepared for that, but we still have not finished the job there. 
Got it. Um, Mario, what, what do you anticipate the ROI to be to the to the um, Beehive attendees attendance? Oh, let me see if I understand your question. Are you asking of what's the return on investment for the beekeeper or for us as a company? For, for the beekeeper. Sorry, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> yeah, the, the beekeeper um, usually makes around $600 per beehive, right, a year. So the cost of losing a beehive is $600 worth of revenue. The bees themselves cost around two hundred dollars if you was gonna buy them. Uh, so having a a unit like ours that has a cost of four hundred dollars a year, uh, but you only have let's say ten percent coverage, so that your real cost is forty dollars a year, right? Uh, Forty dollars a year against uh, six hundred of revenue, the beekeeper should pretty much uh, be able to to pay it and eagerly pay it because otherwise he's going to lose half of of his units so of his beehives, right? And and the cost of that is not only the lost revenue but the cost to replace it. So it's about. A, by the time you lose your hives and replace them, uh, you're backwards $800 to $1,000. So really prevention is a key here. And, and uh, the, the threshold, the price that we, we've said is, is pretty much in line with what they're expecting. Because right now, an inspection service done by a human being costs about $37 for one inspection. Our, our unit transmits daily, as opposed to just being one inspection. So we think we're with the right price. Price. Um, those are the kinds of things that we will refine over time. Uh, right now we're selling at this price, and and we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's definitely very sensitive uh, in the hobby side. It is very price sensitive because it's it's an impulse buy. It's not a, a necessity. Uh, on the commercial side, it's really a tool. So that's right. that's where the difference in pricing goes. Interesting. Cool. Um, well, any other questions from the attendees? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, well, uh, Mario, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, fascinating work. Uh, keep up the keep up the good work. Please keep us posted on on uh, developments. Would love to um, hear how 2019 and uh, 2020 go for you, and uh, wish you nothing but the best. Um, what can the audience help you out with here? As as you know, uh, we have attendees here, and and hopefully uh, the attendees will be sharing this with other people. Um, so people listening to this, um, what, what, where can they find you and, uh, what, how can they help you out? Yes. Um, uh, hi, .com. It's our website. And in Facebook, we're also as hi, Genie. You can follow us in Twitter and in LinkedIn as hi, Genie as well. So that's where we'll be posting, uh, most of our, uh, communication efforts. We're going to launch a mini campaign for uh, hobby beekeepers in the next couple of months. Uh, this campaign is just aimed to finish our revision two inventory uh, because we, as I told you guys, we are expecting a revision three boards in the next couple of weeks. So we really want to just uh, fi finish all our revision two inventory. Revision two is not uh, 3G enabled, it's only uh, Wi-Fi enabled. So it's, it's better suited for hobby beekeepers that have their bees in their backyards or in their rooftop. Uh, uh, so those are, are the last generation. Revision three would be not only Wi-Fi enabled, but also cell phone enabled. And we have the same uh, microcontroller as the Alexa 
uh, has the Amazon Alexa. So it's it's very going to be a very powerful unit. We're we're very excited about that. Fantastic. Well, again, uh, thank you very much for, for doing this. Um, to those in attendance, thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we host these calls every week at 3 p.m. Central. Uh, you can register for the AgriFood Conversations uh, by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Um, and a replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. Uh, so if you know others that may want to see this webinar replay, uh, please do share the link and uh, let them know they have access to it. Um, so again, Mario, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to the attendees. We hope to see you next week. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.